The Voice in the Bones by Thomas Ligotti The blackness above was deep and unbroken. Rising into it was a tower with a single opening which framed a pale, quivering light. The aperture was fixed high within the darkness and was engulfed by its dense and voiceless unity. Spreading around the base of the tower was a scattering of much smaller lights shining here and there in the lower darkness. One of these was a lamp set into a wall at the border of a fractured street. The lamp spread its glow upon the gray wall and upon two figures that stood motionless before it. No color in their tight, unblemished faces, no sign of breath under the dark covering of their forms. Simple beings with long fingers and sharp features. Their gaze was clearly focused on a building across that fractured street, rigidly directed toward a certain window there. Every so often someone would peer out along the very edge of that window, though he never looked for more than a moment before retreating out of sight. And he occupied a room where everything seemed to tremble with shadows. The shadows moved slowly, obscuring so many of the objects within the room and appearing to change the outlines of the simplest furnishings. Every shape was imposing itself on another shape, breeding a chaos of overlapping patterns. Sometimes the room itself became altered in its dimensions. Over the course of slow transformations it pushed outward into a great abyss and squeezed inward to create a maze of passages. The occupant of the room remained on his guard in these surroundings. Now he saw something hiding inside a shadow moving along the woodwork by the window, using the shadow as a mask. He nudged his foot against the wall, which felt as if it softly gave way to his touch. But there was nothing in the shadow, or nothing any longer. And when he reached out slowly and pulled the dangling cord of a light, it was not illumination that filled the room, but a voice. Mr. Ha Ha! it shrieked, echoing into many voices around him. Ha Ha! repeated a similar voice. With lethargic caution, he slid toward the window and peeked around the casement. He could not imagine that those keen and jagged voices belonged to the two figures across the street. He had never seen them open their mouths when they called out to him with some improvised name. They only stood firm and watchful by the high rough wall. He looked away. Mr. Tick-Tock! 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 He took another step, an intensely sluggish effort, and stood centered in the window frame. Now they would see him, now they would know. But the ones who had been so patient in their vigil had abandoned the scene, and shadows merged with fading echoes in the room. Then there were new echoes for him to hear. Yet they did not lack definition or intent, as did so many of the sounds produced by the building that contained him. A dull, drawn-out crash or a brief crackling might come from anywhere without giving up its origin or identity. But these new sounds, these particular echoes, did not seek anonymity, and there was a focus, a center upon which they converged. Footsteps, the creaking of a closing window or a slowly opening door, a fumbling among the objects of another room, all these noises spoke a strange language among the surrounding shadows and joined with them in a greater scheme. He began moving from room to room in a laborious expedition and became a fugitive in a realm of twisted suppositions. A window might allow some glaze of illumination, a glassy luminescence, but he was often confused by certain deviations in the design of these rooms. Forced to turn an unseen corner, he was faced with a small door, and around its edges some thin lines of light alternately appeared and disappeared in the darkness. He opened the door. On the other side was a long, low corridor with a row of small lamps that together blinked on and off along either wall. He stood and stared. 
for it seemed that something came into being during the intervals of darkness in the corridor, a swarm of obscure shapes that were but imperfectly dispersed by the returning light, gnarled specters that somehow belonged to the very walls and reached out with their shapeless limbs. He crouched and then crossed his arms upon his chest so that his body would not touch anything which need not be touched. When the light next filled the corridor he ran across the floor and felt himself being thrust forward, strangely propelled by a power which was not his own and which he could not control. A railing caught him before he plunged down a stairwell reaching into the blackness below. Yet these flights of stairs, which from above described a perfect vertical shaft, soon began to wander. They led him down into unfamiliar regions of the building without offering a means of escape, only of retreat. And when he paused a moment to survey the dark world without doors around him, he heard the echoing voices. Mr. Fizzle! they shouted at him in unison. He proceeded to descend the stairway and resigned himself to whatever destination it would lead him always moving with that irresistible rapidity which had possessed his body and confused his thoughts. The echoes of other footsteps were now in pursuit. They appeared to catch up to him as small and barely visible objects, soft and irregular spheres that tumbled past him on the stairs and then faded before his eyes. Soon the others would be able to see him. Soon they would reach him. At last there came an end to the prodigious stairs, and he arrived at the abysmal fundament of the building. The ground upon which he now stood seemed to be of raw clay, cold and tallowy. Ahead of him was a crude hallway, nearly a tunnel, which dripped with something that gave off a grayish glow, and there were other hallways and also doors within the damp walls. It seemed he had no choice but to hide within one of these rooms for upon that slippery ground he could no longer move with the same speed that had brought him there. He turned down one corridor after another. By then the others were with him in those dim catacombs. It was time to take refuge behind one of the doors, each of which perfectly withheld the secret of whatever lay behind it. The room in which he closed himself was lit by a dimmer light than that of the passages outside. It was an oily and erratic illumination which seemed to emerge from thick pools and patches of corruption that mottled the greasy floor. An atmosphere of filth and decay occupied the room. Eventually he always wound up in such a place. There was no end to it, no way out. Everything was melting with rot, yet everything endured, infinite in age it seemed. He could not remember it being any other way. Go here, go there. Look for another place that was not like the one before. Someone must know something. He was about to seek a more tolerable sanctuary when two figures stepped out of some dark recess within the room. Mr. Thump, one of them said without the slightest movement of his thin mouth. So it was not they who spoke, but something else which spoke through them something which practiced a strange ventriloquism. When he turned to try to escape through the door, he found that it was stuck, jammed within its frame by shadows clogging its edges, oozing out like black suet. Thump, 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 whispered the voices approaching. An interval of oblivion passed, and it was an entirely different room in which he awoke. This was a small bare cubicle lit only by a peculiar radiance which shone through a narrow slot in the large locked door. There were no windows in the room. The floor felt gritty and vaguely shifted, as if it were being supported by loose sand. He lay against a wall in darkness, with only his thin legs jutting into the light shining through the slot in the door. A voice was whispering to him from somewhere. Slowly the words gained force, yet somehow they remained an abstract sound which merely flirted with sense, never really cohering. The voice seemed to be reaching him through the wall, for he was alone in that room. And still the tones were emphatic, even piercing, 
as if unaffected by the dulling interference of a barrier. Listen, the voice said. Are you listening now? I am a prisoner here, and now that you have been brought to the tower, so are you a prisoner. It was not always like this. Things have changed in this place since I first came here. What they were like before that, I cannot say. I cannot remember what things were like for me. I can only believe that this is how it is for you. I know that you wonder about those ones who brought you here, and about other things. Are you listening? Someone made them, you know. He is the one who made them. He could do such things. And he did something else, something that he is still doing. For he never truly perished. Perhaps he will return, and when he does, things will change again, because he has changed. How he originated this place and what his mad dreams are about is not for me to tell. Bones and shadows, are you listening? Pale bones and black shadows. And now he is gone, but he is not gone. I know my voice is not the same, if you are listening. It is only an echo now. I have heard so many voices, and how could I not become their echo? The echo of dreams, dreams of bones and shadows together. Do you know the shadows I mean? They draw you toward them. They take you into their blackness. But that is where you would go. Something in the very bones reaches out to the shadows and their blackness. He dreamed about this, and he practiced this dream. The bones themselves are only time-worn shadows, the dust of shadows. Where they are gathered, so are shadows gathered there, and they are dreamed together. Everything is the subject of shadows. Everything serves them and their ends, which is all a mystery. The bones are silent because the shadows have taken their voices. He dreamed about this. Now we are all servants of shadows, and they have taken voices from the bones to join with their blackness. The shadows have taken these voices now, and they are using them. Listen to my words. Things have changed, but everything continues as he dreamed it would be, if only for the nightmare epoch in which we exist. Everything continues, but is not the same and I cannot say what is going to happen or when it will happen, now that the shadows have taken voices from the bones to join with their blackness. I only wish it would all be over. It is too much. Who could dream of such? But the words were interrupted when the door groaned and swung slowly toward him, flooding his cell with a confusing radiance. In the open doorway were two figures which stood lean and dark and without features against the flaring incandescence, yet they were not hindered by the brilliance and moved toward him with a mechanical efficiency. They positioned themselves on either side of his slouching form, then lifted him easily off the floor. He struggled awkwardly, at last gripping one of their pale hands and pulling on it. The skin slipped back from the wrist and bunched up like a glove. Underneath was revealed a kind of stuffing composed of pale chips and slivers that cohered within a thick black paste. They brought him out into the narrow circular corridor, where the brightness of a multitude of hanging lamps eliminated any suggestion of shadows. He noticed, as he hung in the grasp of the two servants, that the neighboring cell had its door wide open and was without an occupant. But when they began to proceed down the corridor, there appeared to be something that moved upon the wall of that vacant cell, evading the light. They passed other cells, all of whose doors were open and all of which betrayed a stirring along the walls within that told them they were not wholly unoccupied. His wordless escorts now pushed him through a peaked doorway cut into the gray inner wall of the corridor. On the other side was a stone stairway which twisted through the heart of the prison. He climbed the stairs slowly and stiffly, with long-fingered hands guiding him. And now shadows appeared upon the bending wall, joining themselves into an unshapely creature, a chimerical guide that knew its way and led him to a place high above. There was no variation in the light around him, yet a sense of gradual darkening imposed itself on him with every ascending step. 
Now he was approaching some vast and massive source of the obscure, a great nexus of shadows, a birthplace and perhaps also a graveyard where things without substance waited, a realm of first and final dreams. The stairs ended as they emerged through the floor at the center of a great room, and here a new species of illumination, a pale and grainy phosphorescence, could be seen spreading throughout the open space around them. This strange light appeared to emanate from several transparent vessels which were shaped like urns and had been randomly positioned upon the floor or atop objects, various in size. Each of these containers seemed to be filled with a colorless, powdery substance from which a cold and wavering glow was sent forth. But this glow, this scintillating gloss, did not reveal the surfaces of the room as much as it coated them with another surface, transfiguring what lay beneath. For in that troubled glare everything lost the density and presence it might have possessed. Wide and lofty cabinets seemed to teeter, barely settled upon the uneven floor. The straight lines of tall shelves took on a slight tilt and threatened to disgorge the countless books so tenuously supported there. So many books were already scattered across the floor, their pages torn out and gathered in ragged heaps that might rise into the air at any moment. Located in a far section of the chamber was an armory of curious devices mounted upon the wall or suspended by wires, devices which could have been hallucinations, phantoms through which one's hand would pass on attempting to use them as they were designed to be used. And they seemed to have been designed for projects that involved rending and ripping, flaying and grinding. Yet all of these instruments apparently had lain idle for ages, displaying a corrosion which further removed them from their former substance and placed them in a category of phantasmal curiosities. Even the long, low table about which these atrocious implements were congregated was dissolving with neglect. Nevertheless, he was forced by his guardians to lie upon this coarse slab and be fettered by straps so decayed that he could easily tear them off. But the stern auxiliaries did not seem to be aware of the true condition of things. They continued to perform routine tasks that once may have had a purpose before being eclipsed by changes unknown to them. Through the brittle haze of that room he watched his keepers as they went about some dutiful business, picking up obscure debris lying about the table, remnants of an undertaking long abandoned, or one no longer practiced in the same manner. This material they deposited in a large chest and locked it within. Then, with the studied automatism of pallbearers, they lifted the chest by its handles and carried it away, descending the stairs at the center of the room, their heavy feet scuffing the steps of that great prison tower. Where they were going he did not know, nor did he think it mattered. With the labored movements of a sleeper prematurely awakened, he turned himself from the table, and it was then that he saw the room was provided with a window, a single opening without glass. But so filled was this aperture with the blackness beyond that it seemed to be only a shadow painted upon the wall. He stepped slowly about the mounds of paper and other waste lying on the floor, careful of the deceptions of the room's ruptured light, and leaned over the window's ledge. What a great distance it was to those structures which were crowded together along fractured streets below. Remaining at the window, he gazed into the great blackness above, which seemed to exert a strange magnetism, a tugging at the tower that rose so near to this mute and lightless firmament. After a few moments he turned away from the window. Now he was alone, with nothing to hold him to that place. But as he moved toward the stairs to leave, he paused and scrutinized the piles of disjecta about him. Among this scattering of odds and ends there appeared to be something like bones or pieces of bones, broken leavings of some enterprise that had taken place here, and there was also such an abundance of jettisoned paper, 
pages dark with scribbling and sloughed off in the chaos of composition. Yet as he studied with greater intentness this mass of wild marks, he began to receive a few splinters of its theme, to read the wreckage of an unknown adventure. He seemed to see phrases, incantations, formulae, and almost to hear them spoken by a shattered voice. The pact of bones and blackness, the voice declaimed. The collection of shadows, shadows binding bones, skeletons becoming shadows. And he came to understand other things, the land stripped of flesh, the reeking earth ripped clean and rising into the great blackness. This reverberant discourse had made him its student, imparting theories and practice. Bones pummeled into purity, parts turned to brilliant particles, the shadows seated with a voice of skulls, the many voices within eternal blackness, the tenebrous harmony. Somehow these words were summoning him through a voice in his bones. Now he was with them, and he fought against the shadows as they sought his bones and the bones he sensed everywhere around him. There was an echoing clamor of shrieking multitudes, a world the originator had left to run on its own until his return, a tick-tock world where the work begun in the tower would continue. Would these bones always be in the grip of shadows and the blackness? Could they reach somewhere else, or perhaps nowhere? Like his fellow prisoner in the tower, he now wished it would all be over. It was then that he heard the voice in the bones speak of something different than it had before. What it told him was not the hopelessness of being shackled to this world. Instead, the voice awoke in him the memory of another time or another place that had not been so abused by changes. Nothing of the kind had ever entered his thoughts, so far as he could recall. That he now conceived of such a thing could have been due to his reading of the words of the originator who might not have been the originator at all, but also a prisoner from another time or another place, a time and place before the existence of this world, or any world. The pact of bones and blackness, skeletons becoming shadows, the eternal blackness. Maybe there was a way out, and the originator had discovered the ultimate change by which he could leave all changes and never return. Not an unending existence of changes, but a changeless oblivion. To all appearances, there had been someone who knew something of all the principles which composed anything that could be called a world. Somehow this one had been overlooked or forgotten. Everything seemed it would never end. The thought itself had been obliterated in the minds of everyone he met, and in his own mind. Once it had been a fearful thought, something to be changed, non-being. Over eons the fear had been eradicated, and then the thought itself. But the initiator, with his incantations and formulae, had recovered the secret of the voice in the bones, and those who knew them lost the invulnerable condition they had evolved, the awful state of the perpetual. Joyous of his newfound mortality, he walked to the window and bounded across its ledge. Now it was over for him. One day it would be over for all. That terrible dream of everlasting changes that held us to a place that never should have been if its greatest intention led only to wallowing in the muck of eternity.